Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Catskills. Our minister is Reverend Bob Janice Dillon, who will be back in the pulpit on May 29th. I am Vicki O'Doherty, a member of the worship committee and the worship associate for this morning. A big welcome to our, all of our Zoom attendees today. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal, real liberal religious faith that carries no creed and welcomes all seekers. We are guided by a set of principles and written sources that encompass the many ways we have come to know and understand the world, the universe, and the divine. Our principles are important to us at UU Catskills, and we live our values on a daily basis. We affirm that Black Lives Matter. We are a welcoming congregation for the LGBTQ community. We are a congregational affiliate of the Ulster Immigrant Defense Network. And we are an active voice in the effort to address climate change. Our community circles connect members with others that live in their local community. There are nine circles in different areas who meet monthly in person or online through Zoom. If you would like to get in touch with the circle in your area, please contact the office administrator. If you would like to contact someone at UU Catskills, for those attending online, a contact list is showed right, shown right here. Uh, you can visit our website, uucatskills.org to find contact information also. And, and also to be added to the mailing list and to find the latest newsletter. If you're a visitor online and would like to be added to our mailing list, you can put your name and email address in the chat box area on Zoom. I remind you that if you're joining us online that during the service, you are encouraged to stay muted. We encourage you to read our main newsletter and th that members and others on our distribution list received by email. It is also found on our website. There, <clears throat> there you will find newsworthy items on the happenings in our UU community and also upcoming events for the month. Weekly updates are also sent by email and there you will find events for the coming week. I asked my grandma. Thanks to everyone who's participating in today's service. Um, our Zoom services are made possible by our technical team. Our Zoom host this week is Jenny Gideo Brady, and our usher is Kathy, well, is actually Pat Hurst. Pat Hurst. Our offertory on music is performed by Constance Rudd, and my thanks to Jeff Ryder, who lent me his tripod so that I could make. Uh, mostly steady-handed videos of today's guest speakers. After the service, for those attending via Zoom, please stay for our breakout rooms for a virtual coffee break. For our prelude this morning, we have a video recording of Pete Seeger performing his song, song Guantanamera. I asked my grandson to start singing with me a few years ago because his Spanish is much better than mine. Spent nine years in Nicaragua and uh, so we're singing a song. I actually learned this. I was singing at a children's camp 33 years ago, 32 years ago. And the kids said, oh, you've got to le learn this song from us. We learned it from our counselor who came up here from Cuba. And this very shy young man was introduced to me. I said, gee, I don't know Spanish. But when I heard him sing the song, I got, I got to try and learn it. It's one of my favorite songs in the entire world now. I've sung it in 35 countries of this world. And I hope you join in on the refrain. Yo soy un hombre sincero De donde crecen las palmas Yo soy un hombre sincero De donde crecen las palmas y antes de morir me quiero echar mis versos del alma. Guantanamera, Guajira, Guantanamera, Guantanamera, Guajira, Guantanamera. Oh, 
some people are singing beautifully, but others maybe. Repeat just one word, Guantanamera, I'll try it. Guantanamera. Now you know half the song. Guajira. Guajira. Now sing it. Guantanamera. Mi verso es una verde claro y de un carmín encendido. Mi verso es una verde claro y de un carmín encendido. Mi verso es un siervo herido que busca en el monte amparo. Canta, tu anda. truthful man from this land of palm trees. Before dying, I want to share these poems of my soul. My verses are light green, but they are also flaming red. The next verse says, I cultivate a rose in June and in January for the sincere friend who gives me his hand and for the cruel one who would tear out this heart with which I live. I do not cultivate thistles nor nettles. I cultivate a white rose. Cultivo la rosa blanca en junio como en enero. Cultivo la rosa blanca en junio como en enero. Para el amigo sincero su mano franca If you have a chalice, please light it as I light mine. And please join me in our chalice lighting words, which are on your screen. We light this chalice in grateful, loving community. Even in the darkest of times, may its flame fly past 
to courage, justice, and hope. And now please join me in the unison affirmation. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love to all living beings. May we know once again that we are not isolated, but connected in wonder and joy to mystery and miracle in the universe, in this community, and in each other. Our climate action, climate change wisdom today is brought to us by Greta Thunberg. To all of you who choose to look the other way every day because you seem more frightened of the changes that can prevent catastrophic climate change than the catastrophic climate change itself, your silence is worst of all. The opening words titled, Gathering in Our Own Spaces. Come, gather, not into a common space, sharing a physical clo closeness we long for, precluded by wise choice, but come, gather into this common time and a common space. We need to be together. We yearn for connection. We hunger for the familiar faces of friends, the sound of shared voices proclaiming who we are, where we are going, that which resonates with our hopes, our dreams, our values. Come, gather. We are here in this space made of all spaces, and we share our becoming in this moment. Please join in hymn number 21 for the beauty of the earth. The words will be on the screen. Our story for all ages today is called The Truth About Old People, which is written by Alina Ellis. Hello, boys and girls. My name is Alina Ellis, and I'm author and illustrator. And today we will be reading one of my books, which is called The Truth About Old People. And this is actually quite a funny book because the words in this book are not at all what the pictures are. So the words are telling one story and the pictures are telling something completely different. But let's open the book and see what it says. The Truth About Old People by Helena Ellis, which is by me. The story begins on end papers. Can you see a little boy coming through the front door of his grandparents' house? 
This is the entrance of their house and you can see lots of things that belong to his grandparents and you can probably tell a lot about their characters just looking at the things that you can find. For example, tandem bike, a surfboard, lots of suitcases and even some African masks which probably tells us that they love traveling and they are pretty adventurous the truth about old people. My grandparents are really old. They have wrinkly faces, a little bit of hair and funny teeth. And what about your grandparents? How do they look like? I've been hearing lots of strange things about old people. Some people say old people are not much fun. Well, this isn't true. Old people are great fun. Look at this boy enjoying his grandparents. I surely thought that my grandparents were great fun. They say that old people are slow. Not all, pe all old people are slow. For example, these ones are really fast. Look at the granny. She looks quite adventurous. She wants to try something new. Grandpa is not so sure though. But in the end, they all are having great fun. Old people are clumsy, not this granny. She is a master in the kitchen. She can surely do her pancakes really well. And old people are not bendy. Well, these are. I bet this granny can even do the splits. Someone told me old people are scared of new things. Well, they only scared of the things that they don't know, but once you show them how to use new things, they can be pretty good at them. Old people don't dance. They sure do. Look at those two. They dance really well. My grandparents were great dancers. I bet they danced better than I did. And old people definitely don't care for romance. I have to tell you a secret. There is no age limit on feeling in love and on wanting to kiss each other. So whether you are 15 or 25 or 105, the love is always in the air. They say that old people are quiet. Well, not this bunch. They are definitely having the time of their life and they look pretty loud. And old people are not at all adventurous. Well, usually old people are very adventurous. They just keep it a secret. But I know the truth about old people. That's a quiet moment between the boy and his dog. They're having a conversation. Old people are amazing. And they sure are. I'm sure my grandparents were pretty amazing. And how about yours? Do you think your grandparents are amazing? The end. And this is the end papers. And the boy is going home now. He spent the whole day with his grandparents. And you can see slight differences between this picture and this picture. Like the dog is now laying comfortably and the parrot is a bit sad to see the boy go. And lots of other changes. Uh, if you have the book, I wonder if you can spot all the differences between the front papers and the end. That's it. Now grandparents really need some rest. Our words of meditation and contemplation are called Let This Be a Place of Silence by Barbara Stevens. Let this be a, warm, a place of warm and gentle silence, the silence that soothes and comforts the wounded, the silence that yields in, insight into heart and soul, the silence that calms, the silence that listens, the silence that speaks, the silence that renews, let this be a place of warmth and gentle silence. Take a moment, please, to pause and be still.
half plate donations for May 2022 will go to Rise Up Kingston. Rise Up Kingston is a grassroots organization led by those experiencing racism, classism, and gender oppression on a daily basis. They organize to win with collective power a Kingston economy that meets the social and environmental needs of all people. Their website is https. Well, anyway, it's riseupkingston.org, okay? You'll see on the screen that there are several ways to contribute to UU Catskills for our plate this morning. You may donate by using our website, uucatskills.org, right slash donate, by texting to the number given or by going online to uucatskills.org or by using the phone app, Vanco. You can also email your donation to our office address. You can mail it, or snail mail. For our offertory, Constance Rudd will perform the song, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, which is a Rogers and Hammerstein classic song. On the meadow, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye, and it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. They see me ride by, but a little brown maverick is winking her eye. Oh, what a beautiful morning! Oh, what a beautiful day! I've got a beautiful feeling Everything's going my way All the sounds of the earth are like music All the sounds of the earth are like music The breeze is so busy it don't miss a tree and an old weeping willow is laughing at me oh what a beautiful morning oh what a beautiful I've got a beautiful feeling Everything's going my way Oh, what a beautiful day Thank you. Thank you, Constance.
Today's sermon messages are from some of our elders in this congregation. The first person that we'll honor is uh, Stan Goldstein. Stan, who is 99 years old, is a World War II Army Air Corps veteran who now resides at Ferncliff Nursing Home. And Jenny has some more to say about Stan. Hi, um, I'm going to share my screen so I can show you some photos of Stan and uh, I'm just going to um, spotlight me and share the screen to show you a photo and something about Stan Goldstein's history. I've tried it here, I don't think it will so, work. Um, so Vicky, just mute yourself for a minute and I'll just move on to the slide about Stan. Vicky wasn't able to interview Stan, so I found a photo and a little bit of background. When I first came to UUCC in 99, Stan was there as one of the welcoming committee, and he was a longtime member of the amateur scientists. He and his wife, Wanda, were such integral members of the community and such um, strong voices for social justice. This was an article I found from the Daily Freeman, 2019. Um, this is a photo of Stan from when he was a navigator. Um, he wanted to be a pilot and he flew for the RAF in, um, oh, for the 8th Air Force across Europe. Um, he lives in the Hudson Valley. He was in the senior residence on Washington Avenue. So in 2019, he was 95 years old. After the war ended, Stan returned to the United States and went to pilot school, but he didn't become a pilot. He took advantage of the GI Bill and he went to the University of Oklahoma where he met his late wife, Wanda, who grew up there. And I'm sure many of us remember Wanda fondly and the great work she did in the Hudson Valley. Wanda's parents were less than thrilled, but ultimately agreed to a marriage that lasted more than 60 years until her death a couple of years ago. Goldstein said, while at the University of Oklahoma, he joined a group seeking to integrate the college, which would not admit black students. Imagine coming out of World War II and going to a college that doesn't allow people in because of the color of their skin, Goldstein said. So eventually Stan became a, um, a professor and uh, when he retired, he took a group of students to China for the summer. And later he worked on New York State program that helped minority students. Stan was an inspiration to so many of us. So Vicki, I'm going to hand it back to you. Mm -hmm. Got it, okay. Thank you. One of the delights of this service for me was being able to visit members of our congregation to hear their stories about how they came to Unitarian Universalism and what it means to them. And I wanna thank all of them for their time and for their stories. Our first video is of Jeff and Carol Ryder, who were fairly recent, who are fairly recent members of the congregation. They moved here from Florida and have been long-term members of Unitarian Universalist congregations, both in Florida and here. They're, they're newer, but they are dedicated members. 
What was it that brought you to Unitarian Universalism? Well, you never knew that's where we'd wind up, but the path that led us was so, um, it was like, it was inevitable. 1966, I was hired by a fellow teacher to be a counselor at a camp that was uh, founded and supported by the Society for Ethical Culture in New York City. The other teacher and I um, worked up in the Bronx for um, very specialized kind of kids, loved the job. And it turned out that this other teacher that I was hired with was a roommate in college with Jeff. So the three of us went off to this very open kind of, I mean, if, if it wasn't ethical culture, it would have been Unitarianism. That's how similar it felt, but I didn't even really know about it yet. Anyhow, we went there for three summers. We had wonderful times. We were teaching during the winter and counselors during the summer. And then I got a phone call on New Year's Day, 1969, to wish us a very happy new year from my former theater professor from the University of Miami. That particular winter, 1968, we'd had a snowstorm, also known as a blizzard, a garbage strike, and a teacher strike. The good old days. <laughs> and Dr. Phil Auer, Phil as he was called by those of us who were lucky enough to know him, he and his wife Emmy were going off for a whole year on sabbatical and they had this audacity to ask us if we would like to spend a year in Miami living in their home. I think it took us maybe five minutes to maybe make a decision. Maybe six or seven. Six or seven because we didn't want to look too anxious. But we decided, yes, that would just be fabulous. We quit our jobs at the end of the year. We moved, we gave up our rent-controlled apartment on Broadway and 80th. We did all the things you're not supposed to do. Never looked back and we got to Miami on uh, July 20th, 1969, if you remember that. Nobody looked up from the television to welcome us because they were all watching the moon landing. Anyhow, before they left for Europe, Emmy and Phil said to us, you know, you might like to pay a visit to the Unitarian Church in Miami that we are members of. They knew that we were ethical culture people and it was similar, but you know, they, they knew us well enough. So we went one Sunday in uh, the very beginning of September and Reverend Fred Lachane was giving his sermon. And, and Jeff was a conscientious objector. And remember, this is during the time of the Vietnam War and everything. And there we were in this Southern Miami Unitarian Church. It was Unitarian Church then before it was Unitarian Universalist. And there's this minister, this sweet guy, and he's encouraging us to be conscientious objectors to go out and march against a war in Vietnam that our country was involved with. And Jeff turned to me and I turned to him. And we thought, this we, is it. This is it, we're <laughs> home, place. this was it. And it was, Yeah. and it was for the next 50 years. And our kids were raised there. We were involved with uh, jazz concerts, we sat on the board, we did all sorts of things. I was an RE teacher. I just, our whole life was centered there. Mm -hmm. They were welcoming, wonderful, warm. The kind of preaching that was done was like uh, the stuff that Spinoza speaks about. It was, the heaven and hell that you experience is the, the one right here. Mm -hmm. There isn't an afterlife and if there is, it doesn't count because you got to do this one first. And all of the things that were shared and given to us were just these 
just a, a wealth of experience of being with people, extending yourself, helping out others. Uh, it was the first time we ever, that I in my life, collected t-shirts and socks and underwear for homeless people on the street, mm. uh, bringing food to people in the 70s, the 80s. I mean, there were things that we were going through helping people out after a hurricane, mm. uh, just all sorts of, you know. Not eating lettuce. Oh, the <laughs> lettuce boycott and the <laughs> grape boycott. And who was leading it? But one of our Unitarians, and it was incredible. <laughs> um, it was quite something when Cesar uh, Chavez uh, visited and we had a whole lot to do about that. Yeah. Mm. Right. And Dolores Huerta, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, you know, we were, you know, our fields in Miami were some of the places, the very places that some of these workers were struggling and, and, and bending over to pick the food that we take so for granted. So we felt that we, we had arrived home. This was such a good, a good match. Mm. And then we came up here and we had to find another match and it had to be the same it had to be as same as you can possibly i mean no uu is ever the same same mm -hmm. but philosophically religiously the message is the same the principles are the same and we were lucky we came here yeah what do you like about unitarian universalist congregation of the catskills that is warm and uh, it isn't very large. You can actually meet people and, you know, it's it's not like a thousand people and, oh, the faces are... No, it, it's, a, it's a stream as opposed to an ocean. And it's, it's just a warm, inviting place to be. And that's what we wanted. Mary Alice Scully is our next video. Mary Alice is a former sister of charity. As a nun, she was also an anti-war activist during the Vietnam War and has a claim to fame of protesting the war and being arrested in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And here's Mary Alice. What does you, you mean to me? Well, I first learned about you, you from Christine Archambault, who was my life partner. Christine was an avowed atheist, but she was drawn to you, you, and she became not only a member, but a board member of you, you. I was raised a Catholic. I continued to be a believer in the holy even though I did not attend church any longer. That is, until Christine brought me into the UU. What most drew me to UU was the profound sense of community there among all the UU members. It was not a unity of religion per se, but rather a community of people. And it was that, that community of people that I became committed to by going to you, you. Judith Chase graciously accepted my request to be interviewed about why she is a Unitarian Universalist. Judith is an accomplished weaver. If you want to see her work, you need to look no further than the weaving that is behind the pulpit on Sunday morning at our congregational home. She here she gives you an idea of the early years of UU Catskills.
paper oh. that I saw one time that said the Unitarian Fellowship um, is pausing for the summer. They'll, they'll be back in the fall. So I didn't even know there'd been anything going on like that. And I looked for it and look, sure enough, come fall, there was an announcement in the Freeman. <clears throat> and, and I said to Jim, here's this, this thing your mother was talking about. Maybe we should go. And so we did. But this time we had a little child and we had two children actually and started going to the picket house. And it was a very small group. I'm, I'm sure no more than about 20 people. Shortly after it was founded, and um, I remember Lynn Bernstein coming and doing leading music programs for us. And she, you know, she played guitar or her um, kalimba or something. And she said, "Everybody can sing. You don't have to know all the words. You can just sing along." Uh, singing alone scares the hell out of me because I can't carry a tune, <laughs> and I'm aware of that. So. I can sing in a group because you can't hear me that way. Um, but we started going, and and uh, I had written a paper in college about deism because one of my professors said, "Well, you ought to check this out. This might be something you'd be interested in." And, um, so I did some research on deism in the 18, 17, 1800s, and found it okay. But I didn't pursue anything until noticing this announcement in the paper and um, that's how it really started very simply nice people friendly people um, the woman who was a president at the time i never can remember her name but i can picture her she was a history social studies teacher in kingston and one of the outstanding things in her life was that her home was used for the tootsie movie that they made <laughs> Ethel or Edith or something. I can't remember her name. Um, but she was a very nice, very intelligent person. She did a lot of um, sermon ki kinds of talks and people volunteered. And there were small numbers of kids. And so, of course, you get invited to help with Sunday school, which was mostly craft things and reading a story and then um, mm -hmm. juice and cookies. And, and it went from there. So what keeps you coming back now? Well, it's a habit, <laughs> and and I think it's so necessary. It's such a necessary point of view, in view of our very troubled world. The people I've met, you, Vicky, and and others I've known for, since it was 1966 or seven that we joined, but we've been coming for a couple several years before that because Peter was two and he was born in '64, so. We've started coming to the fellowship then. And it was a, a lively bunch of people who ran this this effort by everybody volunteering to do something. Um, we had the house given to us by uh, Anita Truman Pickett, and we were there for a long time. Then we sold it, but with help from the um, UUA, Although it wasn't the UUA at that time, it was had a different title. Unitarian Association. Yeah, and and then it then it joined with the um, Universalist, so then it became a UU thing. But in the beginning, it was just Unitarian that um, was located here mm. with wonderfully industrious people who worked very hard to keep it going. And then we would we we finally grew a little bit, so we had a little bit of money. We had this house we had to maintain. And we had um, we would invite speakers if you had a friend who was read a lot of books, it might give a book talk. We had some Unitarian ministers come, you know. <laughs> the traveling folk that would come through every <laughs> once in a while. Some of them came back more. Um, consistently. Mm -hmm. We had one man, West, uh, West, West Fall, West Hall, West something, and he, he lived maybe somewhere in Catskill or across the river, and he became a member, and he was here a lot, and he would frequently offer a, a, a minister's program. That was mm -hmm. very nice, and I, I can remember him talking about, you know, trying to 
create a system whereby we had people who would work on keeping the property up, finding speakers, becoming officers. Obviously, that had to be done, too. Mm -hmm. So he began to give us a little bit of shape and confidence. And I don't remember who it was who died one time, but a long, uh, for the time, a long time member. And he talked to us about how you, how you deal with these life issues that do come along. And mm. uh, he said, one of the first things you do is you don't sit around and talk about it. Somebody goes to be with that person who's had a death in the family. Mm. It must have been a husband or a wife. Mm. And he said, nobody should be alone in that matter. You should know each other well enough that you can just go, drop everything and go to be with them. And actually that's that's what we do, but maybe not as dramatically as that, is mm -hmm. there's this interchange uh, communication amongst us. And I do think we welcome people. It gets a little harder to do when we aren't meeting the way we usually did, but um, with a system in place to reach out, we make it possible to get to know the new people and, and welcome them to come and share what we have. That is very, it's a community. And I that's what I wanted our, to be in our name was a UU community, but mm. I wasn't successful in persuading enough people. So we became a congregation, which is okay. <laughs>Uh,
I think the social action and, and the intellectual vitality um, that this congregation have uh, and had as well, you know, I mean, it's not just now, but it really drew me in. And I wanted um, also my, my was band, <laughs> my ex-husband um, had picked up my son's ashes uh, after he committed suicide. And um, I wanted to be able to have, to, to plant a tree so his friends could come as well because the service that we had for him was the day after his death. And people couldn't normally, some people couldn't come. Uh, and at one point, my husband was not letting me you know, do that, plant a tree or do something that was open to, to people who cared about him and knew him. Uh, but because Unitarianism was so important to him, uh, I felt this is the right place. Uh, and Linda said, yes, it's a step. Having a memorial garden would be a, a step that is logical in the development of a congregation. Uh, and uh, shall I pick that up for you? No, it's okay. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so um, we started talking about it, and I gave a, a very, to me, very generous contribution from what I was earning as a poet and a, a, a writer at that time. And um, then I realized it's no more my memorial garden for my son. <laughs> it belongs to everyone else in the congregation just as much as, as mine, my interest. Um, and uh, we couldn't, people wanted fountains and people wanted all different kinds of things. The Bahuniacs also made a contribution. So um, along finally came Carl, came to a meeting and it was just, uh, you know, a night. <laughs> uh, here is this perfectly qualified person, so calm and, uh, and kind and uh, we could say, well, Carl says, and here he is the person who creates trails, you know, for the government um, and knows about uh, also our, our background that we were living on Native American territory mm -hmm. that was once um, a home to Native Americans, and so his idea of a memorial garden that would be like a council circle um, was right on. And, you know, people couldn't complain Good. <laughs> about, about it. Uh, and, uh, so I felt, you know, really wedded to the congregation through, through him as well as my early experience in Newburgh. Mm -hmm. You know, it felt right there and it felt very right when I joined here.
My thanks to all the people who shared their stories and um, we may put these in writing at some point. Please join in singing hymn number 191, that's number 191, When I Recall My Childhood. It's by Jabandanath Jonath Tagore with music by Alfred Morton Smith and performed by the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore. Our closing words are by David Hicks McPherson. It's titled, The Lifelong Goal. To wish for compassion, to pray for courage, to experience doubt, to bear sorrow, to strive for sureness, all these are qualities for which each of us should be grateful. But to feel a genuine fellowship for the whole human family, to act, so that our empathy is evident wherever we go. That's the object. That's the lifelong goal. Join me in saying the words on the screen as we extinguish our chalices. We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our song benediction is with Catherine Catabian. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share. And from this we live, from you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. You're invited to stay and you will be automatically assigned to a breakout room for where visitors are welcome and you can meet congregation members in the room. It'll take a few minutes for us to transition. So join us if you can. <laughs>